Here at John's Bones, we're fortunate enough to have a large medical collection, but unfortunately enough, most of the largest medical collections in the world are actually in Europe. Here at John's Bones, we worked extremely hard to bring more public accessibility towards this field. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Today, we're going to be looking at the Fool's Tower. John's Bones. So the Federal Pathological Museum in Vienna is known to be one of the largest of its kind in the world. This collection was founded in 1796 in collaboration with the postmortem department of the General Hospital. The Federal Pathological Anatomical Museum in Vienna is reputed to be the largest and oldest museum of its kind in the world. The museum later found a home in the Fool's Tower. So the old General Hospital itself was founded in 1784, but the year in which the Fool's Tower was built, it was a nursing facility of remarkable size, with over 2,000 beds for treatable patients. The collection of the Pathological Anatomical Museum initially consisted of exhibits that were supplied by the hospital's post-mortem room, but it has since been augmented by numerous objects obtained by autopsies and surgeries. Originally in Europe, medical collections had close relationships with hospitals, and oftentimes when an individual would pass away with a rare pathology or ailment or deformity, the hospital would actually donate it to the museum in order to preserve it in order to improve education and understanding. By 1971, the Fool's Tower had amassed over 45,000 pieces in their collection. Since the collection is so large, we couldn't fit everything in this video, but primarily with our background at John's Bows, I wanted to focus on their osteological section since it was so diverse and had so many different specimens to look at. I just wanted to make you guys aware that some of the pieces in this collection are quite sensitive, so moving forward in the video, if this is something that makes you uncomfortable, I wanted to give you a heads up before we moved on with this tour. I think what's so interesting about this book is it shows a range of pathologies and abnormalities that can be seen within the skeletal system. Here at John's Bones, the types of medical skulls that we work with are regular individuals, but this collection primarily specializes in extreme deformities and rare pathologies that haven't been seen really anywhere else but this collection. So it provides a really good juxtaposition between what a regular medical skull should look like, as well as skulls with abnormalities and pathologies. Within this collection, there's so many diverse specimens and osteological tools that can help us learn and better understand human anatomy. But what's super interesting is even within the US, we really don't see collections of this gravity and scale. So I think that being able to have access to this book is such an interesting thing, and I'm so glad that we're able to look at it today. One other thing I wanted to point out is I'm from Thailand, and the most famous pair of conjoined twins are Chang and Ang, and originally they were from Siam. But in this book, it showcases hundreds and hundreds of conjoined twins within the fetal developmental stage. Interestingly enough, I feel that people oftentimes think that conjoined twins are extremely rare, but because of how far medical technology has advanced, we are now able to detect it and treat it early on. But within this book, we can see thousands and thousands of examples of how this has been seen throughout the ages. Even though conditions like conjoined twins, plagiocephaly, scaphiocephaly are rare, we still see so many examples of them in this book, and I think that provides such a stark contrast to what we really think exists in the world. Oftentimes, people think that conjoined twins are one in a billion, but really the condition is a lot more common than people think. It's because of books like this we are able to see the historical implications of what conditions like this would look like. What I think is also incredible about this book is it shows how far medical technology has really come. A lot of the conditions that we can see within this collection are now treatable today. It really shows the importance of studying osteological pieces and how it can benefit humanity in the future. If we look here, this is a fetal skeleton that suffered from anencephaly. This is a condition where unfortunately, the fetus develops without a brain and almost dies instantly after birth. It's extremely sad to look at, but I think that pieces like this show the importance of medical science and why medicine that can help detect and be aware of these conditions are extremely important. Here we have two skeletons that actually has ratchetus, and interestingly enough, one is 61 years old and the other is 68. So that means that they had lived with this condition their entire life and survived with it. And being able to see their skeleton so elegantly preserved so future generations can learn from it is extremely important. You know, I think when looking at this book, um, I want to try to be as respectful as possible when looking at all of these skeletons and different specimens throughout the ages. 
But you know, as I said, um, this is something that isn't talked about and having osteological collections like this and even the photography to view it is extremely important. I mean, outside of this book, the average individual would have no ability to see or learn about conditions like this. And oftentimes these photos don't exist on the internet due to the sensitive nature of a lot of these specimens. So examples like these books are the only way for the average American and the average individual that doesn't have access to legacy collections in order to learn about it. This individual here suffered from hydrocephalus. It's a condition that causes water to form in the brain. And if it isn't treated fast enough, it actually causes an extreme enlargement of the skull and it needs to actually be drained with a shunt. So a shunt is inserted in the back of the skull and attached to the abdomen so excess fluid can be drained. After that, this is a condition that can be treated, but if it isn't detected early enough, it can actually cause a lot of premature deaths in children. This individual here also suffered from rickets, which was another condition that greatly affected this individual's skeletal structure. So being able to look at this skeleton and appreciate it is extremely important. This is a fetal skeleton with osteogenesis imperfecta, or it's also known as brittle bone disease. There are four types of osteogenesis imperfecta, and type two is terminal. And if they detect that the baby has that, it typically will not survive. Babies with osteogenesis imperfecta type two, oftentimes their bones are so brittle that they can actually break within the womb. Here we have a fetal skeleton with a cyclopic face. This is actually two children, but they share one face. Both of these pages actually showcase this. And I think that's what's so interesting about this book is oftentimes people think of conjoined twins. They only think of twins connected in the waist, but actually there's so many different versions of this that could occur while the fetus is developing. This collection also showcases skeletons that have scoliosis, kyphosis, and other spinal conditions that could be seen within the human body. Here within the collection, we actually have three skeletons that suffer from a variation of different spinal conditions. Here we see examples of scoliosis and kyphosis. This is actually a hunchback that can be seen within the spine that is extremely overarching. It's extremely rare to find skeletons like this today, and to be able to see one in the osteological collection is extremely rare. As I've discussed earlier, I'm primarily focusing on the osteological section of the collection, but I did want to point out that this collection also has a variety of wax models that they use for learning, as well as early surgical equipment and also wet specimens within the collection. But primarily, since we focus on bones here at John's Bones, we wanted to showcase this section today in the video. On a lighter note, the museum actually has a resident cat on staff that is helping to guard their collection. This is because moths and mice can actually damage osteological collections. So having a cat there to help guard the collections is actually extremely important. Actually, when looking at this book, I barely covered the surface of what is actually in this book. In this collection, there are actually three books that accompanies the entire museum, and this is only one segment of it. So if you guys are interested in seeing this book or purchasing one for yourself, you can actually buy one on our site at johnsbones.com. This book has been out of production since 1990, and here at the business, we have all of the available copies remaining left in the world. But it's our goal to make osteology more accessible and to raise public awareness about legacy collections. So if you guys are interested in purchasing one from your own, be sure to click the link in our bio.